Welcome to the Organ Podcast from the Royal College of Organists with me, Mark O'Brien. Coming up, I meet the man who runs the National Pipe Organ Register, and I talk to one of the world's leading concert organists, Thomas Trotter, about his career and having recently celebrated 40 years as the City Organist of Birmingham. But first... I'm standing outside Buckingham Palace, where, as you can hear, they're changing the guard, which is incredibly good timing because I'm actually on my way to the guard's chapel, which is literally just across the road from here, where the finishing touches are being made to a brand new Harrison and Harrison organ. I'm on my way to meet Andy Scott, the managing director and head voicer of Harrison's, to hopefully get a bit of a preview of this organ and to find out what makes the Harrison sound. Well, Andy, we're in the nave of the chapel looking up at your work. The scaffolding is still there, but gleaming pipes behind it in the North Choir Gallery. Am I right in thinking this is a 100% brand new Harrison organ? That's right, it's completely new. Uh, It's something that we don't get to do very much these days is to build a completely brand new organ in England, especially. uh, We get a lot of work in the States, but this is a brand new instrument here in the heart of London. And does that mean you've made all the pipes yourself? How does it work? Well, if we were to build the organ completely ourselves, which is well within our ability, the project length would be much longer uh, because of having to make all the different pipes ourselves. And w- with our resource in Durham, we, we just don't have the, enough people to make it happen all at once. So the majority of this organ's been made in Durham by our own organ builders, but we've also been assisted by Penny's Mill, uh, who made the case, and they've made lots of organ cases. And our friends at Terry Shires and Booths in Leeds, pipe makers, um, and also some pipes in here, the, the copper front from Germany. But from your point of view, is this a real treat for you? Because you, in a sense, have a totally blank canvas onto which you can create the Harrison sound. That's right. The, building a new organ gives us the ability to have a modern expression of what we are as a company. And of course, the, the sound of a Harrison organ, everyone uh, thinks of the Arthur Harrison area, uh, and we call him Mr. Arthur, and we still refer to him affectionately today as Mr. Arthur. Uh, but there's a lot of things on this organ here in the guards that Arthur Harrison would instantly recognise. Uh, there are a few things that he would probably raise an eyebrow at, um, but it's for you know modern taste. And it's not about revolution with organ tone, it's about the evolution. And you know, even though today at Harrison's we still look back on our heritage, we still look into the future. What is the Harrison sound? How would you define Because I often hear people talk, you know, almost in a generic term, any sort of cathedral organ with four manuals, sometimes it's just labelled, oh, a Harrison and Harrison, even if it isn't. From your point of view, what is the Harrison sound? I think the Harrison organ, if people were to, you know, nail down what what is the sound of a Harrison organ, I think it's that roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, putting on a big warm jacket. That you know, it's the romantic organ in in the true sense. I think is is what a Harrison organ is. I mean, that creates a lovely image on a technical thing. Mm. I mean, are there sort of secret ingredients you have in terms of the size or scale of your pipe or the alloys? I mean, is there a bit more to it than that that you look for, or is this top secret? No, it's not top secret. I mean, there's that famous analogy of if you have your grandmother's cake recipe, it's never quite the same. And I believe it was Schulze who said, you know, they can have all my pipe scales, but they don't have my ears. It's the same with an organ. The, the DNA of any organ is, is in the pipe scaling. And we, we have things in Durham and other firms have similar records themselves, but we call them the metal lists. And they are the written DNA of, of any instrument. And we have these going right back to our founding and we can look up the DNA of what what Arthur was doing with the relationships between the stops so he would take his open diapason for instance and then he'd make his four foot principle maybe two notes smaller and then his two foot which sits on top of that maybe one or two notes smaller again so you get this natural attenuation and this is written down this is in your archives and that you would look at and study absolutely and when I became head voice of course we I've grown up in the kind of coming out of the tail end of the organ reform movement which was you know quite 
radical in terms of organ tone in England and you know was coming to its height in the 1950s and of course the Royal Festival Hall is probably the largest expression of that for our firm at least and our voices were having to work in this very alien style to what they were accustomed to so we, we've come out of that and my predecessor Peter Hobbs as head voicer in his entire career as head voicer at Harrison's he never ever was able to build an organ with an open wood on the pedal organ because that wasn't wasn't where we were tonally there was lots of open metals and of course those uh, of you who know organs the open wood provides the the big foundation to the organ pedal department so all the organs built through the kind of 70s 80s and even into the 90s were being built without open woods and here I am you know 12 14 years I think it is since I became head voicer they're like buses they they all come (laughs) along at once so we've got an open wood here at guards we've got one at York Minster, we've got one at Canterbury, we've got one in Greenwich, and they're back in fashion. So the, the organ has come from the organ reform movement where we were talking much thinner foundation work, much heavier upper work, uh, lots of mutations. But we've come full circle almost back to the romantic organ. So here at the Guards, we, we took the brief of the organ's got to accompany the professional choir each week it's got to accompany the congregation and it's also got to uh, work alongside the military bands in concert and in services so a tall order for an organ in quite a small space so this is only a three manual organ here and based on the size of the chapel the resonance of the chapel I drew up the pipe scales on paper and how each of the stops would fit together and that's that's the magic for me in creating an instrument because you never know what it's going to be like till you're sitting here in the chapel and you hear it for the first time. But the layout is interesting. So the three manuals, the bottom manual, you're calling the orchestral rather than a choir or a positive. Then we get to the grate and you've got two grate divisions, a primary and a secondary grate, and then the, the swell on top. What made you go for that design? The beauty of this instrument is there's no one division fighting through another. You go to the typical English parish church organ with your swell organ behind the grate, and the swell has to work a lot harder to be heard through the grate, whereas here everything is speaking from immediately behind the front pipes. And one of the the reasons we kind of heard for, for this orchestral organ is the the role that the organ's got to play here and we didn't want to have a a, a sentimental English choir organ that only did one thing of course the orchestral organ here we have five stops we have a, a flute harmonic we have a violoncello We also have a 16-foot Lieblich board on, which is a chimney flute um, from middle G upwards. And then we also have a 16-foot Corno di Bassetto. And quite large. Have those been voiced already? These have all been uh, voiced in Durham and they've come here to the chapel and we're just now regulating them really. Mm. The great organ is split into two primarily to allow more flexibility but it also allows things like two small principal choruses, one for accompanying the choir and then a larger one for going with the, the congregation and the band. So the diapason chorus on the secondary choir. Accompaniment. Yeah, accompaniment yep. great. But this is also where you'll find the, the corn air, if you like, um, with a stop diapers and a clarabelle flute, and the nazard, the piccolo and the tears. And then the primary grate, if you've got the brass band in here, or the military band. That's right, the primary grate, we've got a larger chorus. We haven't got the open diapers in at the moment, but I'll put something in from the secondary just to, to prop it up. So this is the primary grate chorus um, from a 16-foot double geigen, which is in the front for the bottom octave, uh, which sounds like this. <laughs> In the swell, we've got two lovely little strings, Celestial and Celeste. And of course, you can combine that with the violoncello from the orchestral. And 
And then there are other strings in the organ. There's the violin diapason, there's the double geigen, the great number two diapason, and the four foot geigen principle. So you can get this big wall of string tone from a three manual organ. I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, it's mainly eight foot yeah. sound. And have you got a lovely solo high pressure trumpet? We do. Um, <laughs> I mean, building up to we've got on the, on the primary grade, we've got a low pressure. And uh, when I say low pressure, great reeds and a Harrison organ, you might think of trombers and uh, things like that. Here we've got an eight foot pazon, which is only on uh, 89 millimeters pressure, which is three and a half inches in old money. Mm. And then we can contrast that against the swell trumpet, which is on seven inch pressure. big high pressure orchestral orchestral trumpet uh, sounds like this and this is on 10 inch pressure this probably isn't in tune but we'll give it a go we're, we're sitting here you've got a, a, a looks like a homemade portable keyboard you've got an iPad on your keyboard with the stop names showing what are you doing? How are you voicing this organ? So what we're doing is making the, the kind of very fine adjustments to make sure that the relationship between each stop and the relationship between each pipe of each stop are all exactly right in the building. This keyboard operates on Wi-Fi. <laughs> the organ has its own router. So this keyboard enables me to sit here in the chapel and listen to each note of each pipe, each stop, and just get the balances perfect if we take a, a stop that we, we haven't yet done, um, for instance, or something that you can hear, and we have a, a, a hot boy here, or an, an oboe. This um, is on the swell. And this is on the swell, and, and these pipes only arrived here in the chapel last week. So these are straight out the factory? These are straight from the factory, put in the holes here, and we literally tuned them on Friday last week before we left. So this is completely undone. Um, Having heard it last week in the building, I know that this, in my opinion, this stop needs to come out of its box a little bit. It's a little bit buttoned up. It's a little bit old fashioned. So that note you've stopped on the A did sound a little bit vibrate-y. That's right. So we've, we've got all of those tiny little things. So I'd be, I'll be here and my colleague in the organ would obviously hear that too. Um, he would remove that pipe. Now I guess that that pipe's got a little bit of dirt in it from transit um, mm -hmm. from having been in the crate he would clean the tongue put it back in and then we would tune it again and then we'd carry on but if we if we go down the scale you can hear how some notes are louder some notes are softer than the neighbors Yes, that F was um, a weaker. Yeah. A bit buttoned up, mm. that's right. So every time you play a note, you're making micro decisions all the time. How are you going to do that? I mean, presumably that's going to take a long time because what, a pipe for every note of the keyboard? And you've got to remember or have in your head what that has to sound like. That must be very difficult. To bring this whole hot boy out of its box, if I'm just sat here talking to the microphone, I want to continue talking exactly the same. And if I just put my hands over my mouth like this, I sound different, but I'm still talking exactly the same. So I say that oboe wants to come out of its box a bit. It's a slotted oboe, so if we just open the sides a slightly, a little bit more, um, it lets a bit yeah. more torn out of the and, pipe. And, and where on the pipe? What are you actually physically doing to do that? This would be the slot right at the top of the bell at the top of the pipe, um, the opening, and, and that would give the pipe more space for the sound to come out of. Do you think organists fully appreciate actually what is going on in a pipe when they sit down and play something? I don't think organists do fully know, and, and I, I'm an organist myself, and, and that's how I got into organ building. And I think it's really important for organists to, to begin to understand you know, what happens under the bonnet. I'm not suggesting for one second they should just take the panel off the organ and go climbing in there unsupervised <laughs> because you can do a lot Disaster. of damage. But I, I, I think if organists understood how 
pipe tone, organ tone is created, they'd have a, a greater appreciation for what they're doing on a musical sense. You know, the organists should, you know, learn a little bit about their instrument, just like they learn about the repertoire and the kinds of organs that that repertoire will be played on. Certainly for me as an organist and an organ builder, the two go hand in hand for me and the two complement each other incredibly. So can we go up into the organ case? Can you actually show me uh, a bit of physical voicing that you can do? Yeah. So well, should we go up? Let's go. Yeah. Before we go up there, we'll just come round to the console and I'll tell you about a, a couple of things on, on this console that are different to other consoles that we've built. Uh, the first thing is we've got MIDI keyboards here. They're contactless key contacts. Is that right? So there's nothing behind these? There's no action? Just a magnet and a sensor for each note connected through MIDI. Right where you're sitting there, this key shelf here. Um, so this is between the, the stop knobs and the console? That's the keyboard. right. We call it the key shelf. Um, you put your phone on there, it starts charging. <laughs> That's too much. That's too much. <laughs> How and, did you do and, that? And, and of course, well, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a desk wireless charger built into the key shelf, so instead of putting a cup of coffee there, which one should never do, um, we've got uh, a wireless mobile phone charger built into the key shelf. And of course, many of us are playing from digital media these days, and um, so in the side of the music desk here, we have a USB-A and a USB-C plug-in port so people can charge their digital media while they're rehearsing. You know, how many organs do we go to where you're scratching around for a plug it to plug in your phone while you're rehearsing or trying to plug in an iPad and you're worried about whether you're going to last through the service or not. So you're going past the wind chests and up. I assume you never have enough space when you build an organ, do you? Organs were never designed to be worked on. So quite a narrow oh, hatchway. To, to climb up. Right, gosh, very cramped up here, isn't it? So where yes. are we now? What are we looking so at? So we're now in the kind of middle section of the organ, if you like. We have the bottom octave of the 32-foot trombone. Gosh, just as we pass them, it would be wrong not to... Uh, <laughs> I know what's coming. ...play a few notes. <laughs> My face is right next to it. What pipe are we? You're, ne you're next to... <laughs> This is bottom F sharp right next to you. Bottom F sharp. Um, go for it. <laughs> so that's the biggest pipe in the organ. Bottom C. We've also got the, the pedal open wood here right next to us, so if I play these a little bit for you. Might come out depending what kind of speakers well, you're listening to. Well, what did come out? I could, bits of dust and bits of wood from the, the actual mouths of the air went up. But I can see why you have to be downstairs, because being this close to the pipes, they don't really make much sense. No, no, that's right. There's no kind of... There is a focus to the note, but there's no kind of context mm. here, and, and that's why we listen downstairs. There the are even stories of Arthur Harrison sitting in the nave uh, with other people toing and froing, bringing pipes to him. Um, and they used to wear slippers back and forward so they didn't make a noise. Good grief. So he would actually then manipulate the pipe. The pipe would then get sent back up to... Wow. That's right. You've got time on your hands for that one. Absolutely. When, when <laughs> labour was cheap. So we're moving into a, a chamber. I can see it's got shutters. We're in some sort of swell box. That's right, we're inside the orchestral organ at the moment. I thought I would just tune through this orchestral corno di bassetto and also listen for loud and soft while I'm here and adjust maybe one or two of those as we, as we go along. Um, if I make this note softer, you'll hear how it uh, goes closed up in its tone, so we'll, we'll make it softer. <laughs> So 
So that, that note's actually gone quite grumbly now, quite gruff because it's quite soft. You can actually hear it. Mm. Kind of bounces to its note. So if we do the opposite, we make it louder again now. If I just take the tuning stop out of its hall, we can hear how this has come to life, this note. So it's a much cleaner note, it hasn't got that bobble to its start. Um, and we have to go through that with, with every one of these. So to, to regulate this stock could take anywhere from two hours, three hours to a whole day. How do you get into this? Are you an organist first and a builder second, or was it through building you became an organist? Well, I've been working for Harrison's almost 30 years now, and I was 12 when I decided I wanted to be an organ builder, and I haven't regretted that decision for one day, and I left school age 16, having just finished my GCSEs, to start an apprenticeship at Harrison. So my father was a club organist, so I learned on the Hammond organ <laughs> first, I should have said. But the organ came first, the organ building came second, but I've always married the two together, and I've been a church organist all of, all of my life as well. So the organ is a big part of my life, not just at the weekend playing them, but every day, uh, it's a privilege, really. Andrew Scott, thank you very much indeed. Now, how many pipe organs do you think there are in the UK? Well, I'm afraid there isn't really an accurate answer to that question, as we're about to find out. But nevertheless, a man who has a fairly good idea, and who works alongside a dedicated team, curating some fascinating archive and research of about 37,000 surveys and specifications of pipe organs in this country, is Andrew McIntosh. Andrew looks after the NPOR, the National Pipe Organ Register, and I went to meet him to find out what this work involves. So this is fun. Right now, we're at the nerve centre of the National Pipe Organ Register. And it's nice. It's a laptop on your table, Andrew, overlooking the River Tay here in Dundee. Yes, And how, how long have you been running this? So I've been manager of the NPOR for 12 years, working with a team of volunteer editors who do the updating work, and the whole thing is supervised by a committee of BIOS, which is the British Institute of Organ Studies, uh, who are the custodians of the register. But there's more to it than just looking at stop lists. I mean, there's always the anorak in us that want to see, you know, does this place have a 32-foot reed or something? Absolutely. But do you think that there's a greater element of research that this site can now offer? Because it's changed when you log on to it now. It's changed to how it used to be a few years ago. That's correct. So what started out as a listing of organ specifications has broadened over the years and BIOS has been able to add other resources to enrich the data. So we have the Dictionary of British Organ Builders, for example. We also have the Historic Organ Sound Archive, which is a project led by Anne Page in East Anglia some years ago with recordings of historically informed repertoire that's appropriate to those instruments. We also are able to link to uh, the British Organ Archive, which is held at Birmingham University. And we also have the Historic Organs listing scheme. So you're really pooling all of these resources now into one place. You can access all of these. Absolutely. And, And how many people use this site? How many searches? Can you tell me how many searches you get? Uh, at the moment, it's roughly 25,000 searches a month. I'm really surprised. I mean, even if you said 25,000 a year, mm. I would still have been surprised. But 25,000 a month. Yeah, we, we have interest worldwide. But most of our, our business will be driven by players in the UK who are off to play an instrument that wanted to find out more about it. And there'll be people doing historical research, obviously. We get searches coming from uh, people who are interested in in the instruments in their church, who have interest in local history and and stumble across us. Now, you're an organist. I mean, I think you'd have to be to do this. Uh, Yes. (laughs) But when you're working on this, do you find yourself suddenly, you know, going down a rabbit hole because something has sparked your imagination or something you find fascinating? Do you get lost in your own work with this? Absolutely, yes. And there are so many 
interesting things that sort of crawl out of the woodwork. You discover all sorts of things about odd place names. I mean, even ignoring the organ side of it. Saints that you've never heard of. Interesting instruments, interesting histories of instruments. There'll be occasional bits of, of local colour. There was one organ we had where the, there was a note on the record that says access to the instrument can be had by asking at the bar of the red line across the road. <laughs> Judging by the state of that organ, you probably need to go back to the red line after, <laughs> after you've played it, I think. Um, so yes, it, it can be very easy to, to get lost. Can it tell you how many pipe organs we have in the UK? Not exactly, no. I can tell you how many instruments we have listed on the database. How many? 37,000. 37,000? 37, yeah. Does that mean there are 37,000 organs in the UK that we know about? No, it means there are 37,000 specifications. So for an organ such as York Minster, for example, which has changed many times over the years, that will have several different surveys Mm -hmm. which track it through time. So uh, the number of organs will be lower than that. We know that we have something like 26,000, 27,000 buildings on the register. That is not comprehensive either but that will give you a figure in the high 20,000s of organs that either exist now or have existed in the past. It's always been clear that it's a never-ending task and there are always going to be gaps in in the database and we always need people to tell us where those gaps are. So in, in the larger churches such as the Church of England, the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Scotland, coverage is pretty broad and getting better and the more you go out into the smaller non-conformist churches the thinner it gets but there have been specific projects there was a big project to add Methodist churches well can we put this to the test because I grew up in Wales yeah so as a teenager I played a little organ in Cardigan and the West Wales coast so if you put in St Mary's yeah Cardigan no. Oh, there we are. Yeah, well, there's St Mary's, Finchley Square. Okay, click on yep. that. So what's it telling us? This was surveyed so, in 1986. I, yes, there's two surveys, actually. It, it was built in 1877 by Forster and Andrews. I didn't know that. And it was surveyed by somebody in 1944. Oh, that is interesting. And so that, now you can see the yeah. evolution of this. It is that detail. I can see the stop list of what it was in 1944 and then the stop list of what it was when I played it. We also have in the British Organ Archive a number of references to that organ. It was overhauled in 1894 and then Hill, Norman and Beard uh, must have taken on maintenance in the 1920s. This is very detailed. Who would have done this research? I mean, this is more than I thought. Yeah, so that comes from research that's been done by volunteers at the British Organ Archive. Well, there was me thinking you wouldn't have it because it's in West Wales in a Mm. a small town. But you've got other instruments nearby. We put in Cardigan. Yeah. You see, now this is interesting. Right at the top, if you scroll back up, there is Capel Maer. Now, I remember that. That's a, a Welsh chapel. We were always jealous of Capel Maer because they had a reed on the grate <laughs> and there aren't many organs in that area at all, I think, right? in, in guarding. Where they had, yeah, there yes. we go, on, on the grate. That's what I remember. But that's fascinating. You I see, you, you, the, you're yes. now getting sucked down one of those it, rabbit it, It's holes. true. I didn't know the Hill Norman of Beard did anything about it and I, I didn't know it had um, you know, a different stop list yeah. uh, from 1944. Is there one instrument here that gets the most searches? So I can tell you what was the most searched for instrument last year. Right. Presumably it's a very large instrument. No. It's in a cathedral. No. It's, is it a famous it is. It is not famous in any way. And this is the most searched. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so this is the organ at St. Mark's, St. John's Wood. Why? In, so, in London? In London. Yes. So uh, this is a sad story, actually, because... Hang on, how, how many searches has this had? that makes it the most searched organ on the database. So uh, that had a thousand views. Right. And so the clue is is here, uh, 27th of January, 2023, interior of building destroyed by fire. So what is that is a bad story. Uh, Yes, yes. (laughs) (laughs) it's got a 64 foot read or something. (laughs) 
so uh, yes, so th this was in, entirely driven by by a news story. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that clearly, for a lot of people, presumably many of them organists, the first thing the reaction on seeing that news story was, "What's happened to the organ? Yeah. Or, there must be an organ there." And so that has been driven by that curiosity. But clearly, I mean, looking at this now, although it's fun to look at, you know, the organ stops to see how big or small particular pipe organs might be. But for me, looking at this now, what it really does is give that level of a backstory to the instrument. It's actually mm. giving the instrument a little bit more dignity that actually these do have a story. Yeah. They do have a place in the chapel and churches. They have been built on, enlarged, moved. Mm. For you, when you go and play these instruments, do you think that just gives it a little bit extra? All instruments are, are part of a wider story and they are part of the history of the building that they're in, they're part of a history of the community that they're in. And I think finding out about that history opens up the instrument to you in, in a way that just the bare specification might might not do. But you get an idea of how it's developed, uh, perhaps how the how the church has developed or the town hall or, or whatever it is. And all these aspects of context are important, I think. And you're still looking. So on your site, you can there is a place you can click where you can print off a survey form and then people can email that back to you if they think they've got an organ that's not on the register. That's right. Or they can do it directly online. But it's fascinating, really fascinating. Andrew, thank you ever so much. Thank you very much. Thomas Trotter is one of the UK's most admired musicians and his virtuosic playing is in demand right across the globe. He's performed with the world's most famous orchestras and conductors and has amassed a vast catalogue of recordings and broadcasts. But perhaps he's most at home in Birmingham, where for over 40 years he's been the city organist. I met him at Birmingham's historic town hall, where he had just given his 846th lunchtime recital there. I guess, really, this town hall has been fundamental in your musical career. Yes, I remember my director of music at King's Cambridge saying that every organist needs to have a bass. And I didn't really believe him at the time, but... Um, I'd left Cambridge four years before I got this job and I kind of regard this as, as being my lucky break and it gave me a base and it gave me 30 concerts a year and it gave me kind of like a testing ground for trying out new repertoire. But for the young Thomas Trotter at that point, was this quite, you know, a left turn in a sense because you were the organ scholar at King's College, Cambridge. Uh, you had an, another organ scholarship at St George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. You learnt at the Royal College of Music. You were studying in Paris, Marie-Claire Lain. You were interested in early music. Going at that age into a fixed town hall post, musically, must have been very different to you. Well, I... <sighs> I like all kinds of um, different music. And actually, when I was brought up, we didn't have much music in the house. But I remember my mother used to listen to Radio 2, so I was kind of brought up on that lighter music. And I always liked orchestral transcriptions. So actually, when I got this job, it gave me the perfect excuse to start exploring transcription playing much more seriously, which I might not have had a chance of doing had I had a church appointment. And, and, you know, those organ scholarships to, to King's and St George's Windsor, it was really just a means to an end. I never intended to have a church position where I would be conducting choirs. I've never really been interested in choir training. So when you started here, you were following in the footsteps of George Thorburn Ball, mm. huge English establishment mm. figure in the organ world. And you were very young, what, 25, 26? Yeah. When you, yeah. So he'd been here pretty much since 1949, I think he started. How did you follow with that being so young? Did you have your own way of moving the repertoire on or was there still a, a whiff of the Edwardian era, you know, lurking around the organ bench when you took over? I mean, I met him um, several times and he was wonderful to me. And But I don't remember ever asking his advice. I remember, I remember driving around London once and he said, oh, you're a marvellous driver. But he never said I was a marvellous organist. 
But he was always very supportive and he came up to hear me play on a few occasions. But, you know, I, n I never really discussed with him what I was going to do and how I was going to make my mark on the, on the city organist position. I think you've got to do what, what feels right to you. I mean, obviously, I, I knew what he did and the, the kind of repertoire that he played. And it was quite outdated, really. He used to play probably a programme of... A 50-minute programme would include 12 pieces by different composers. So they tended to be much shorter pieces. Whereas I started playing things like the Royka Sonata and, you know, Vidor Symphony. And did that go down well? I think so. I don't remember With getting his followers, any complaints. His loyal following. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody booed. I mean, I know at one stage I was playing a lot of Messiaen and that that didn't go down that well. And I noticed on the days when, when I programmed a piece by Messiaen, the audience was noticeably smaller. But you see, at the moment, I don't play very much. It's, it's fashions, you know, you, you get onto one composer and then you've sort of had enough of it and then you go on to something else. And you've got to make the audience trust you so that they will go along with whatever you want to play. And I feel like I've achieved that, mostly, uh, in Birmingham. I have a wonderfully loyal following. But is there a difference from playing in a town hall to playing in cathedrals or churches? I mean, do you kind of have two hats on when you're here and then when you're touring? Well, the thing is that when I tour, people expect me to play the kind of music that I play in a town hall. So I end up playing mostly similar programmes. But you're right, there is certain music that suits the ambience of a church and the much more resonant acoustic than suits a, a much drier town hall. And also some of the music I play here, it's very much on the light side, you know, Eric Coates and Leroy Anderson. I mean, I probably wouldn't play that in Westminster Abbey but, but could you? Because I, I well, mean, I could. I mean, I have played Eric Coates actually at Westminster Abbey, but but I probably wouldn't play Leroy Anderson. But you can play it here. But do you think organists overthink that type of approach to music, whether it's a transcription or something that they would call light? Is that really a, a British organist's problem that they've created? Because other instrumentalists wouldn't necessarily define their music by the building they're playing it in. It's sort of just music, isn't it? I think our, it's become much more acceptable for classical musicians to play a much wider range of music. 30 or 40 years ago, it was frowned upon to, to play transcriptions, whereas now it's completely accessible. And, and, and I, I know lots of organists who seem to play nothing but transcriptions. I like to have a balance. Now it's more probably film music. John Williams, Harry Potter or, you know, Hans Zimmer, Interstellar mm. is doing the mm. rounds a lot. Is that then just a fashion at the moment? Or would you see it as the continuation of the transcriptions that you would have had from the 19th century, early 20th century, of just bringing orchestral music onto an instrument that can play it because of the design of that instrument? I suppose it's both, isn't it? Because in the Victorian times, <clears throat> organists made these arrangements to make that music accessible to an audience who had, you know, no opportunity to hear live orchestras. And today, I suppose people like hearing music that's familiar to them played on perhaps a rather aloof instrument such as an organ. It's a way of getting the audience into the sound of an organ by playing music that is familiar albeit in a different medium. You play all over the world. Do you find that you are programming differently depending on which part of the world you're in? Or do you find the audiences, and I'm thinking perhaps in countries that don't have a, a religious association with the pipe organ, do you find that the audience appreciate your performance differently? Well, one thing I always make sure um, I do when I play abroad is always to feature music by British composers. Years ago, I did a few tours for the British Council and they always stipulated that the programme should include British music. And at the time, I thought, oh, I don't want to play British music. But actually, I think it, it was a very good idea because not many organists play British music. And again, that's something that I do and not so many foreign organists 
do. So obviously you have to go on what the sponsors say to you. But therein lies another problem because they say, well, can you play something popular? Well, I don't know what the Chinese think is popular. You know, it's one man's meat is another man's poison. So it is very difficult. Do you think there's still that countries have their own national characteristics for pipe organs? Historically, yes, you know, the French organs are different to the German organs. Yes, and to the British yeah. organs. But you are lucky enough to probably open quite a lot of organs. You do a lot of inaugural recitals all around the world. Have you noticed in your career, perhaps there's some sort of tonal alignment in terms of, you know, national sounds of pipe organs around the world? Well, I suppose if you go to someone like Australia or New Zealand, you'll generally find that the organs tend to be more English-inspired. And, I mean, organ builders such as Hill and Willis, the Victorian builders, they exported a lot of organs to Australia and New Zealand. So there's more English influence there. The modern instruments that you will find in a concert hall have become much more standardised. So uh, a Riga organ built in... Seoul in South Korea is going to display the same characteristics as a regal organ built in Helsinki, Finland. And and one of the reasons for that is that rehearsal time is often at a premium in a concert hall. So organists need to be able to get around them and get to know them as quickly as possible. So there is a certain amount of standardisation. But does that sometimes frustrate you as a performer? Because are you you know, like when you go on holiday, you want to eat the local food. Do you find that can be somewhat disappointing that, you know, you could be anywhere sometimes when you're performing? No, I like it because you, you've got a different audience. You, you're playing to a new audience. So the audience is key for you rather than yeah, the Yeah, and it's their reaction, I think. Definitely. Somehow I, I enjoy playing in a concert hall because you're in full view and it's easier to make that link that line of communication with audience when they can see you all the time. When you're stuck up in an organ loft somewhere, it's kind of more difficult to create that link with them. Are you an extrovert? Um, I think I'm neither extrovert nor... In- I think I'm in the middle. <laughs> I was wondering, because that, that link of, of wanting to have the connection with the audience so much... But that's what it's all about. You have to convey the message of the music, and it's a lot easier to do that when they can see your movements and when they can see you reaching over for a stop and when they can see you taking your hand off a particular chord very slowly. That's all part of the theatre. So how many recitals do you do a year? Well, when I started in Birmingham, it it was a weekly concert, so I was doing 30, which was quite a daunting challenge for a 26-year-old to have enough repertoire to to stretch and, and not repeat yourself within one season. And then in other places, I was doing probably 30 to 40 concerts a year. And now, I suppose, post-pandemic, I'm doing, well, I suppose 25 to 30. I never really count them up. And how do you keep yourself musically fresh? In a sense, where does your musicianship come from as an organist to keep you, I guess, up to date? I think you've always got to keep learning. And whenever I can, I try and commission a new piece, which is a bit like Russian roulette, because you never know what you're going to get. But that's part of the fun of it. But it is to keep fresh, you've got to keep on learning new stuff. And during the pandemic, I was just sitting on IMSLP all day and and Spotify, just trawling the repertoire, trying to find new stuff to learn. And it it becomes more and more challenging because I've already got a huge repertoire. Well, that's my thing. I mean, finding new stuff for you. I mean, you must, Mm. because of your job here and recycling generally. Well, I know, but the trouble is it's got to be a balance because... You want the audience to experience new music, but you want them to know what kind of music you play. So it's important to repeat some of that music so that they get to know your repertoire. I mean, I've got to the point now where I I could play for probably 15 years and never repeat myself. Really? But there are... Well, I mean, because I've been doing the job for so long. But still keep good music because the temptation is just to amuse yourself of playing something new. I mean, the organ is famously limited in certain respects for its repertoire. But yeah, the you... organ has a huge repertoire. The organ has a repertoire of, what, 500 years? And every European country has its own 
tradition and you've got early music and you've got romantic music and you've got 20th century neoclassical music, you've got contemporary music. There is such a huge range of choice. I mean, I'm not suggesting that it's all great music. Well, that's my point. I mean, do you hear that? Do you think organists actually then do give the full expanse of the organ repertoire or do you think it's organists that are limiting to certain key periods in the organ's history? Well, we all want to play great music. So we all want to play Bach and we all want to play Messiaen. So there obviously is a bit of overlap. But I'm, I'm always surprised, actually, at, at how huge the repertoire is. You know, I can go to an organ recital and I think, oh, haven't heard that piece before. And so usually I try and find the music if I really like it. So obviously there is an overlap between what we all play. But there is also an incredible variety. I'm always discovering new pieces. They're not always pieces I want to play, but some of them are really good, and I think, well, why have I never heard that before? So it's it's a continual exploration and discovery for me, which is what keeps me enthusiastic. I mean, I practice two or three hours a day. In, in amongst that two or three hours, I'll spend probably 15 or 20 minutes learning something new. I've always got something new on the go. It's like having in a good book to read. You know, it's, it's really fun when you've got something you, you're enjoying working at and pulling apart and getting to know. Are you quite disciplined in terms of how you maintain your standard with the amount of performing you do? I mean, do you, have a, you do get up at five o'clock in the morning or something to do your practice <laughs> and then run 5K? I mean, are you quite disciplined to, to sustain yourself? I am quite disciplined with, with um, rehearsing. And generally, I'm not happy unless I've started the day with an hour, an hour and a half's rehearsal. Once I've got that under my belt, then I'm prepared to do other stuff, which does include running, actually. I like <laughs> running. But I, don't, I mean, I don't go very far, but I, I, I like to keep fit. So I just feel more comfortable when I've got some hours of rehearsal under my belt. And that's why I don't have a regular teaching job. There's always the risk of being taken over by administration or sort of hours and hours of teaching. I mean, I think it's great. Some people are very dedicated as teachers and and I'm afraid I'm not. And I like teaching, but you can get waylaid. So that's why I always put my rehearsing first. Is it quite a solitary life, though, because you're constantly travelling, presumably, Mm. and... Well, you're, you're all saying goodbye rather than hello, I suppose, isn't that thing? You'll meet new people and then you move on. I, is that quite sort of hard work? Are you missing out on something because of the lifestyle you lead? Well, you usually get treated like royalty. I mean, obviously, the hospitality varies from venue to venue. Some places, and especially with concert halls, you don't get any kind of hospitality at all. But I, I accept that. And any, any hospitality you do get is a bonus really and but people generally are really happy that you're there and you know they make a bit of a fuss of you and you stay and get to stay in nice hotels and you get taken out if you're lucky after concerts and you play in nice nice halls and beautiful churches so yeah i mean it's a, it can be a solitary life but i like shutting myself away in a church and rehearsing on my own you know i don't like standing in front of a choir or an orchestra waving my arms you know, I enjoy that solitude. You're quite a private person. Well, I suppose so. I've never really thought about it. But I certainly enjoy my solitude, definitely. No, I was saying that because of your joined a solitude, but then earlier you were saying you, you, know, you, you love the audience. It was the audience reaction and being closer to the audience physically that keeps you know, your energy going, I guess. Well, organists, we're we're a bit of a sort of odd bunch, aren't we? We're kind of introverted in that we have to shut ourselves away and practice. But then we enjoy our moments in the limelight. And I think that's, that's how I feel. I enjoy shutting myself away and preparing something. But then I enjoy the reaction when people enjoy the fruits of my labour. Now, in 2020 you were awarded the Queen's Medal for Music. I mean, that's a huge deal because obviously it was given to you by Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth, but that medal is for outstanding contribution to the musical life of the nation. 
I mean, that must have been extraordinary for you and you as an ambassador for the organ. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm the first organist to receive that medal and they only award one a year and I was just completely stunned. Never believed in a million years that I would get something like that. But I went to Windsor Castle and I was accompanied by Judith Weir, the master of the Queen's music. And it was basically just her and me in the room and she was standing there and we had a long chat about many different things. I mean, one of the things she was talking about was... Um, this how, is the Queen. This is the mm. Queen, yeah. And she was talking about how um, it's becoming more and more normal for, to have girl choruses singing in choirs. Yeah. And she didn't say anything about St George's Windsor, but a week later, St George's announced that they would be having girls singing in the choir along with the boys. So she obviously knew about that. Mm. She was incredibly well informed and she was as bright as a button. You know, she was in her 96th year. But she was very fragile. You know, mm. she was rooted to the spot. She didn't move at all. And, I, you know, if I just tapped her, she probably would have fallen backwards. And do you, she knew your work. I mean, I don't know whether she listened well, to I the think organ. Judith, but, I mean, Ju- do you, do you... Well, actually, I'd played a concert, a special concert for an anniversary for the Royal College of Organists, which was in St George's Chapel, in her presence, in 2014, and I, I said, oh, I, I was very honoured to play a concert for you in 2004. And she just looked blankly at me. She, she'd completely forgotten. And I'm not surprised. But Judith had written a kind of resume of where I was based and where I played. And so she'd obviously mugged up on that five minutes before I walked into the room. But she was really sweet. She was wonderful. It was a great day. I remember reading an article that you wrote celebrating your 30 years at Mm. Birmingham Town Hall, and now you've been here more than 40 years, and Mm. you were musing in that article about whether that was time for you to hang up your organ shoes. Mm. Are you comfortable? <laughs> are you... You're trying to get rid of me <laughs> No. I think, are you, um, you know, confidently sailing through to your golden jubilee, your, your 50 years? What, what do you think it looks like? Well, at the moment, I've got no thoughts of giving up. Well, I suppose I should give way to some younger person. I mean, whilst I still feel challenged and... Whilst I enjoy what I do, I don't sort of... It's not really in my mind to to give it up. I mean, it would be very sad when I do, because this is such a big part of my life. And I love the town hall, I love the architecture, and I love the, the, the ambience of the place. So it will be a big hole in my life when I do give up. But at the moment, unless I can think of a reason, I don't know, ill health or something... I can't think of any reason why I would stop. Thomas Trotter, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's all for now. Next time, I'm up in the roof of Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral with the organ builders from David Wells as they install a new echo division high up over the East End. And I talk to the chief executive of the Royal College of Organists, Sir Andrew Palmley, about his vision and priorities for the college, as well as looking forward to this year's International Organ Day, which will be on the 20th of April. So until then, from me, Mark O'Brien, goodbye. <laughs>